Um, turn in your Bibles to John chapter 9 as I pray. Father, we just ask right now that you would please be with this mouth and the mind and the words. May they, hear Holy Spirit, anoint them and may they be yours, words, not mine. And Lord, I pray that we will be attentive to what the Spirit has to say to us today. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Light. Light is an amazing thing. How many appreciate light? I do. Yeah. All the colors that we have in the spring, it's because we have light that we can see and experience all those things. But did you know that light is quite a mystery? It's a mystery. Even after thousands of years of scientists studying light, they still don't know very much about light. They know what it does and how it acts, but it's very difficult. At one time, they felt that light was uh, waves um, in the spectrum of electromagnetic waves, you know. They, it was a p small portion of the, of the spectrum of different waves, including x-rays and, and all kinds of other wavelengths, microwaves, and that light was just a wave. But then on the other hand, they felt that as they continued study, it uh, acted like it had matter to it, that it was a, like, my, uh, you know, very atomic um, uh, matter that was particles, that we had because it would act like a beam. In other words, you could you could the light would hit the mirror and it would reflect off here or in a prism and and so it acted like that. So they really didn't know it could because sometimes it acted like particles and sometimes it acted like waves. And so it was quite it's still quite confusing to them. In fact, one at one time, light was the constant of the universe. What I mean by that is that light travels in a vacuum at 186,000 miles per second, okay? And, and so scientists believe that light was, okay, a constant. Throughout the universe, it was a constant. Did you know now that, I didn't realize this, I just learned this uh, uh, this week, that light, they have been able to slow light down through different matter to the point that they can slow it down so that it, it moves like a millionth uh, less than what it travels in a vacuum. In other words, it just goes really slow like this. You can watch light just go across. You know, when you turn the lights in your house, all of a sudden, poof, that's traveling uh, you know, quite fast. But it's not as constant as they uh, thought it was in the universe. Jesus said, and this is a follow-up to what Jesus, his claims as the great I am. He said that I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and life. I am the true vine. And today he says, I am the light of the world. In Genesis, in the beginning, on the first day, God said what? Let there be light. And what happened? There was light. There was light in the darkness. Before it was, as, as, uh, as Moses described it, the earth was dark and without form and void of life. And Jesus came, and the Father and the Holy Spirit, they said, let there be light. And boom, there was light. And then, as Moses and the children of Israel were led through the wilderness there, what were they led by? A pillar of cloud by day, and what were they led by night? A pillar of fire, a light in the darkness of the desert, and warmth. And, and it was a symbol of God's presence in the sanctuary above the Ark of the Covenant, the mercy seat. There was the Shekinah glory, the light God's light, and it lit up the whole compartment of the most holy and holy place as a evidence that God was there, his presence. And then Isaiah, the prophet, said that there would come the Messiah, the Messiah who would be a light to his people and a light to the Gentiles. 
Jesus said, when he stood up before the crowd, he said, I am the light of the world. He was claiming the fulfillment of this prophecy in Isaiah. He was claiming in the ears of those people who were hearing him, he was claiming to be the great Messiah, the I Am that Moses spoke about. All light and knowledge of truth about God comes from Jesus. In fact, in Desire of Ages, listen to what she has to say here. We can trace the line of the world's great teachers as far back as human records extend. This means the smartest people who ever lived in the world, all the way back in recorded time. But the light was before them even. As the moon and the stars of the solar system shine by the reflected light of the sun... So, as far as their teaching, these smart people in the world throughout history, as far as their teaching is true, do the world's great thinkers reflect the rays of the sun of righteousness? So, every gem of thought, every flash of intellect is from the light of the world. In these days, we hear much about higher education. The true higher education is that imparted by him in whom are hid all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. One of my favorite stories in chapter 9 of of the book of John. Great stories. You know, there's just some really interesting human interest stories in the Bible. Do you know that? There's several, not, there's just a few of them, a handful of them, but they really have, they really, the stories really bring out humanity <laughs> and really illustrate it in such a way. And this story is, is one of those, and it find, and kind of has to make you smile a bit. You know, there's some stories that kind of are, I think God put in there for a little humor, and this one is one of those. It is the story of the blind man who was born blind. And, and as we read the first, um, first verses of chapter 9, it says, As Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? You know, sometimes, sometimes have you noticed bad things to good people? Have you noticed that? I mean, not everything that happens to us is because we made a poor decision or we didn't, you know, we, you know, people, people who've never smoked or drank still might or maybe have a great diet still may get cancer, right? Bad things happen to good people, okay? And guess what? The opposite is true. Good things happen to bad people, right? So there's no way to explain this, and the story of Job illustrates this. That there is, we live in a dark and sinful world where there is an enemy among us who takes pleasure in our suffering. We always ask the question, why, when we suffer, don't we? When we go through terrible times in our lives, maybe it's health, maybe it's emotional loss, whatever it may be, we always ask the question, why? Why? As if we are expecting some answer to come to us that will satisfy us. Right? What if I told you I could give you the answer to why you're suffering? Would it take away the suffering? Would you feel about it? No. No. And we oftentimes wonder why God doesn't tell us exactly why we have to go through what we do. All he tells us is in, in Romans 8, 28, all things work together for what? Good to those who are called according to his purpose. So what we have to experience, we can trust God. And even though Satan joys our suffering, even though he may enjoy it, God can take that suffering and make something good if we would just trust him. 
I don't know. I don't have all the answers. But one day, God's promised me that he will give me those answers to my satisfaction. But remember that Jesus is saying and talking about this in a spiritual sense. Because spiritually, we were all born blind. We came into the world blind. We can't see God or his character. And we are like this blind man stumbling around. We didn't ask to be born in a sinful, suffering world, did we? But here we are, born blind, blinded by our sinful and selfish nature. Verse 3 and 4, Jesus answers them, and he says, It was not that this man sinned or his parents, but that the works of God might be displayed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. Jesus is the light of the world. Through him, light comes to our sinful, darkened world. Just as he said in the beginning, let there be light, Jesus came to give us hope to save us from our blindness. And so while Jesus was on this earth, his light shone to all who desired it. John says, in him was life, and the light was the light of men, and the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it, and the true light, which gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. When Jesus returned to heaven as our high priest, he said that he would be the light of the world until then. Because Jesus also said, you are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand, and it gives light to all those in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. Jesus said, as long as I am here on this earth, I am the light of the world. But he left. So who did he leave to continue as a light in the darkness? Us. We are a reflection of the, of the, of the light of the world. We are a reflection that Jesus uses us to light the world around us. Verse 6 and 7, it says, Having said these things, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva. Ew. You know, in the Bible, in Genesis, it says in chapter 2 that God reached down and got dirty, didn't he? He formed man of the dust of the ground. He had to have a little mud, don't you think? And he formed man, and he breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. You and I are but dust, right? But with God, with the light of the world, we are more than that to God. We are his children and it says that he spat on the ground, mixed it up, smeared the mud on his eyes, and said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam. By the way, what does the Bible say Siloam means? It's in your Bible. No? What? Sent. Siloam is sent. The amazing thing in this story is, is that what happens? He goes down to the pool of Siloam, and what happens? He washes his eyes, and then what happens? I can see. Which means that when Jesus takes away your blindness, and you can see, what does he ask? What does he do? He sends you to share that light with someone else. That's amazing, isn't it? There was a purpose why Jesus sent him to the pool of Siloam. There was many pools in Jerusalem, but he specifically sent him to the pool of Siloam. He sent. So he went and he washed and he came back seeing. Now Jesus opens our eyes and we become his witnesses to the power of God and we share that light with all of those around us. 
Verse 8, the neighbors, these friends of the beggar, and those who had seen him before as a beggar were saying, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some said, It is he. Others said, No, it's not. It's not anything like him. He kept saying, It's me. I'm the man. So they said to him, Then how were your eyes opened? Okay. Well, he says, the man called Jesus, made mud, anointed my eyes. I said to me, go to the Siloam and wash. So I went and washed and received my sight. And they said to him, well, where is he? I don't know. You know what's, what's amazing about this story? Kind of humorous. You know, as we watch this man, can you just imagine? He's coming back. He's so excited, I can see. He comes back to his old neighborhood, his own corner where he used to beg. And everybody's asking him questions. And he just, he's so excited about it. And they say, what, 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 what happened? And he tells a story. Did you know that all of us have a story? I used to grow, I was growing up in high school, and they'd bring these people who have tremendous stories of how God delivered them from kinds of things. How many remember those stories of people coming? And Yeah, I mean, man, and my little story, my simple story was, I just fell in love with Jesus, and, and that was it. What more do we need? Right? Maybe you think, I don't have a real exciting story to share of this, some miraculous deliverance or where there. I don't have. I'm going to tell you, this man had a great story, but it was a simple story. I just went and washed as he told me to, and now I see. A simple story. Every one of us has a story. A story of how God has brought us into relationship with him. A personal story, only that you can say, and you need to share that. Share that. You may think, well, God, give me the opportunity to share that simple story. You'll be amazed how many opportunities you'll have to share your one story. How people will come to our li- in, our, in our lives and do that. If you haven't got a story, I, it's exciting, because Jesus is just waiting to put his mud on your eyes and, and help you see. It's okay, it washes off. Each one of us has that story. The gospel, my friends, we often try to make the good news complicated. And I am guilty of that. And I think as a church, oftentimes we have been guilty. We have, but this church has been given a, an abundance of knowledge of, of Scripture and, and, and things that God has revealed to us is amazing. And I appreciate every bit of what God has showed to me growing up in this church. But I still tell you the gospel is still simple. I was once blind, but now I see. It's as simple as that. Remember when, G- when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness? He said, look and live. I looked, and now I live. Why do we make, we think, like some people say, oh, pastor, I can't give a Bible study because I don't know all this stuff. And How much did this guy know? Just tell me, how much time did he spend with Jesus? Huh? Jesus just said to him, smear the mud on, go wash. That's all he knew. But he was able to share his story, wasn't he? I don't know, this guy Jesus came up, put mud on my eyes. I went down and told me to go down and wash. And I went down and washed, and now I see. Simple as that. The gospel, my friends, doesn't have to be complicated. And you can just share what Jesus has done for you. That's all he's asking you to do. You don't have to give a study on the 2300-day prophecy and, and this and that, although those are great information and great stuff, but most people in this world are looking for, a, is Jesus real in your life? Do you have an active relationship with him? Is he make a difference in your life? It's not what you know, my friends. It's who you know. The Creator came into my life and said, let there be light, and there was light. Well, 
my friends, there's always the lawyers. Do we have any attorneys in here today? I'm sorry if there is. Verse 13 of the, of the story. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had formerly been born blind. Ah, the lawyers, the Pharisees, they knew the law. There's always enters the skeptics. And they brought the Pharisee, and now it was, what? This all happened on what day? No. It happened on the Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. So the Pharisees again asked him how he had received his sight, and he said to them, well, he put mud on my eyes, and I wash, and I see. Simple as that. Some of the Pharisees said, well, yeah, this man is not from God because he did this on the Sabbath. Well, the others said, well, you know, think about it. How can a man who is a sinner do such great miracles? And there was division among them. Oh, I feel so much better about our church. Phew. I thought we were the only ones. Right? We can disagree and still love each other. Amen? I, I, you know, I've had disagreements with uh, Yogi. Boy, I've had disagreements with Yogi. <laughs> but I love that man. Don't you? And I know he loves me. Because he tells me. But you know what? Then there was division. There was division among them. The skeptics who question your experience, be careful, be aware, be, be, be cautious of them. Because they can't even agree. We must be careful that we don't write off, write off. Listen to this. We must be careful that we don't write off everyone who has a different experience with God than myself as from the devil. Do you hear me, from my friends? Because I believe that they are Christians, good followers of Christ who love the Lord with all their heart. They are not part of our denomination. I have met them. And just because they may worship on a different day, or they don't, even wor they don't worship the whole day, they may just a few hours, but just because they go to church on a different day does not mean that they're of the devil. Jesus said, you are the light of the world. And how in the world are you going to bring light to a person if you just say they're of the devil and you stay away from them? Now is not the time to be Pharisees. The church does not need a church full of Pharisees. It needs people to go out and build relationships with our community and with those around us, even if they don't believe the way we do. We must be careful that because you know all there is to know about everything, which I, growing up, felt that I did, to be careful that you don't miss the tree for the forest. Could we be blind even though we know the truth? Huh? Jesus said it is right to keep the Sabbath and to tithe, but not at the expense and neglect of love, mercy, and justice. We should do both. Amen? In fact, Paul says, if I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I am as a noisy gong or clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but if I have not love, I am nothing. And if I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but I have not love, I have gained nothing. Even Jesus' day, they were divided among themselves about well, who was right. People have a tendency to believe what they want to believe, and then they find evidence to support what they believe. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is the light of the world. Be careful. We don't reject him again. For all the knowledge that we have means nothing unless we have Jesus. 
verse 17. I've got to hurry through this story because it's so good. I haven't even got to the climax yet. So they said again to the blind man, what do you say about him since he has opened your eyes? And this man said, oh, I guess he's a prophet. But the Jews did not believe that he had been blind, and so he called in his parents and uh, the man and tried to get them to testify that he wasn't born blind, that this was not a miracle, it was a hoax. So they asked them, is this your son who has said he is born blind? How then does he now see? I like this. Isn't this amazing? His parents, it's kind of what I would say too with my kids now, they're grown. We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but how he now sees we do not know, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him. He's of age. He will speak for himself. Now, why they did that was because they were afraid of the lawyers, the, the attorneys, the Pharisees, because they would be kicked out of the church for good if they testified anything of Jesus. So in verse 24, it says, So for the second time, they called the man in, had been born blind, and said, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. Isn't that amazing? The first, they bring the parents in to discredit the miracle like it never happened, okay? Now they can't deny that because the parents, I mean, it's obvious that he was born blind or that the parents said that he was born blind, so there's testimony in favor of this man. And so then here he goes up, and so they, now they try to say, oh, it may be a miracle, but this man could not have done it. It must have been God who did it for you. So who do you think Jesus is? Because that's the most important question you'll ever ask yourself. Who is Jesus? John wrote in his gospel so that we might believe. He wrote these stories in his gospel, he said, because I want you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. You know, it's amazing to me that these parents were so afraid of the, of the Pharisees. But that's the kind of religion that, was, that, that the church had established. It was a fear-based religion. Uh, maybe some of you have experienced that before. That, that a religion, a church, is based upon fear. They, it didn't really happen so that... Uh, oh, parents were scared to testify of Jesus. It was a fear-based obedience. And fear... Let me tell you this. The Bible is very clear about this. Fear-based obedience is shallow and surface obedience. Do you know the whole Old Testament tells me that? As you watch the history of Israel, it was a fear-based uh, uh, obedience. All that the Lord says we will do, just don't zap me. Right? How long did that last, their obedience, by the way? Yeah, not even, a, hardly a month. Maybe a little over a month. We'll give them some leeway. 40 days. That's all it lasted. And I'm going to tell you something in your life. Fear-based fear obedience, it looks good on the outside, but it won't change you inside. Do you hear me? It looks good on the outside, but it will not change. It is the power of Jesus that transforms as the light of the world. It is the power of his love that changes us on the inside and becomes evident on the outside when it has taken place on the inside. God's love constrains us to obedience because John says perfect love casts out what? All fear. Love brings meaning to our relationships with God and each other. We become lights in the darkness. 
Verse 24, so for the second time they called the man who had been born blind and said to him, Give glory to God, we know that this man is a sinner. He is answered, Whether he's a sinner or not, I don't know. You're the lawyers, you know. One thing I, all I know is as I was blind, now I see. They said to him, then they peppered him with questions. Peppered him, one after the other. They said to him, what did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? Boom, 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 boom. They thought, this man is an uneducated beggar. We got this. We can take care of this man. We'll just kind of confuse him a little bit, and then he will confess and sing like a canary. And he answered them, I've told you already, and you wouldn't listen to me. Listen to this. Why do you want to hear it again, he said. Do you also want to become his disciples? Oh! Did he put the knife in and twist it or what? Right? Do you want to become one of his disciples? By the way, did you notice what it says? Would, do you also? Which means that he... How much did he know about Jesus? Not much. But he also claimed to be a disciple already, didn't he? he? In fact, you know what? He'd never seen the man, right? He'd never seen Jesus. And they reviled him, saying, You are his disciples, but we, we are the disciples of Moses. Don't get this wrong. I love this church. I love the Seventh-day Adventist Church because I believe that it has, it has a gift. Not only does it have the gift of prophecy, but it has a gift. We have a knowledge of Jesus that no other denomination has. We have the truth about Jesus that many, many don't have. We have a light that, that God has been privileged. That's why I'm a Seventh-day Adventist pastor today. I love this church. I grew up in this church. I will be in this church until I die. Is it perfect? No, but I love it anyway. Was Israel perfect as they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years? Moses still loved them, didn't he? In fact, he pled for their lives, their eternal lives. In fact, he said, take me first and, and, and spare them. I love this church. I love what it stands for. But it always not, has not always represented the gospel like it should have. I think it's time we change that. I think we lift up Jesus in all the truths that God has given to us in his word, we lift up Jesus has to be the center of every one of those things. I love this man's logic. Verse 29, we know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know where he comes from. The man answered, why, this is absolutely crazy, amazing. The learned leaders of the, of, the, of the church here, and you don't know where he comes from, or, and yet he opened my eyes, he says. Now, this is what's amazing. This man does not have a law degree. He's a beggar. I don't know how much education, if he has any education at all. And I want you to be encouraged by this, for this man had had not the education, he didn't go to seminary, he didn't go to get his college degree, he didn't have any of that. In fact, he had only spent, he didn't even know what Jesus looked like. He only spent just a few seconds with Jesus, and yet watch what the Holy Spirit does to this man. This man takes this, and he goes, we know, listen to me, he gets the attention of these lawyers He's got the attention of the court. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, God listens to him. 
Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a blind man. Right? Okay. And they're all going, okay, that's pretty logical, reasonable. And if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. Right? Right. They answered him. You were born in utter sin, and you would teach us, and they cast him out. My friends, this blind beggar, it's like a homeless man who has never been through grade school, taken and putting before the greatest minds and scholars and theologians and lawyers and putting him in the Supreme Court, and he wins the day. He wins the day. Your simple story with the power of the Holy Spirit will win hearts to Jesus and you will shine like the light of the world. Wow. God has taken this man and flooded his mind and heart with the light of the world. Verse 35. I mean, 30, yeah, 35. Jesus heard that they had cast him out. And having found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of God? He answered, I like this, Who is he, Lord? That I might believe in him. And Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and it is he who is speaking to you. And he said, Lord, I believe. I like this. And he worshiped him. Is that your experience? Do you believe? Do you pray for every day for the light of the world to shine in you? Have you fallen in love with Jesus and desire to know him more? Are you like this man desiring to see the light? Or are you like the Pharisees who love darkness rather than the light of the world? Jesus came to give sight to those who are blind, but only if they want to see. Some would rather stay blind because they like it that way. The story is told by H.G. Wells. Anybody hear of his story, The Country of the Blind? Anybody hear that story? While attempting to climb the unconquered crest of a para, uh, Mount Para, a fictitious mountain in Ecuador, a mountaineer named Nunez slips and falls down the far side of the mountain. At the end of his descent, down a snow slope in the mountain shadows, he finds a valley cut off from the rest of the world on all sides by steep precipices. Unbeknown to Nunez, he has discovered the fabled country of the blind. The valley had been, uh, been a haven for settlers fleeing from the tyranny of Spanish rulers until an earthquake reshaped the surrounding mountains, cutting the valley off forever from future explorers. The isolated community prospered over the years despite a disease that struck them early on, rendering all newborns blind. As the blindness slowly spread over many generations, the people's remaining senses sharpened, and by the time the last sighted villager had died, the community had fully adapted its life without sight. Nunez descends into the valley and finds an unusual village with windowless houses and a network of paths all bordered by curbs. Upon discovering that everyone is blind, Nunez begins to recite himself the refrain, In the country of the blind, the one-eyed man is king. He realizes that he can teach and rule them, but the villagers have no concept of sight and do not understand his attempts to explain his fifth sense to them. Frustrated, Nunez becomes angry, but the villagers calm him down and he reluctantly submits to their way of life because returning to the outside world seems impossible. So Nunez is assigned to work for a villager named Jacob. He becomes attracted to Jacob's youngest daughter, Medina, and Nunez and Medina soon fall in love with one another, and having won her confidence, Nunez slowly starts trying to explain sight to her. Medina, however, simply dismisses it as his imagination. When Nunez asks for her hand in marriage, he is turned down by the village elders on account of his unstable obsession with sight. The villager doctor, village doctor suggests that Nunez's eyes be removed, claiming that they are diseased and are affecting his brain. Nunez reluctantly consents to the operation because of his love for Medina. However, at sunrise, on the day of the operation, while all the villagers are asleep, Nunez, the failed king of the blind, sets off for the mountains. 
without provisions or equipment, hoping to find a passage to the outside world and escape the valley of the blind. My friends, Jesus is the light of the world. Jesus came to save us from the valley and the country of the blind. To save us from our sinful nature. But we must be careful that we don't get so comfortable with the culture of this world we forget that Jesus want, what Jesus wants to give us, and that is sight. When we meet Jesus as the light of the world, we will simply say, as I once was blind, now I see. Jesus sends us out to be reflectors of his love, to be lights of the world. If, you had had a, if you've had an experience with Jesus, he calls you to that. If he has given you sight, I praise the Lord. But if you've not had that experience, I encourage you to find Jesus. And he will restore sight to you, and it will change your whole life. Jesus is the light of the world. How many today want to say, you know what? I want to know Jesus better. I want to know Jesus better. Our Heavenly Father is with grateful hearts that you came into the world as the light of the world. You came to this world to show us what God was really like and the love that you have and the good news of the gospel of your salvation and your sacrifice for us. I pray, Lord, that we will simply be touched by Jesus today, that every one of us here will have you touch our lives, our minds, our hearts, and our eyes, and open, open them to the good news of the gospel and your love. And I pray when we each experience that, Lord, that we also can be reflectors of your light to those around us. Let our light shine so that they can bring praise and glory and honor to you. I can't wait for that day, Jesus, when we come to the new Jerusalem and everyone who is there will sing your praises because of what you've done for each one of them. Oh, Lord, I just pray that you will continue to use us and that Riverside here will be a light to the Washougal community, that we will continue to lift up Jesus and lead people to you and that you will give them their sight back. Oh, Lord, I thank you. I thank you for hearing and answering our prayer. And we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.